This is Paul Schneiderman on the 107th edition of the Sports Untold podcast, also on Rainy Raven Radio. I have a very special guest today. My special guest is former Major League Baseball player Rupert Jones. I will go back to Mr. Jones in a minute. My uh, podcast, Sports Untold, is also on Spotify, YouTube, Amazon, Facebook, and other outlets. Uh, Let me get back to Rupert Jones. Rupert is a former Major League Baseball player. He played for about 12 years in the big leagues. Uh, Two-time All-Star, an original 1977 Seattle Mariners member. Uh, I believe Rupert was the first player selected by the Mariners in the 76 expansion draft. Uh, Rupert was also a member of the 1984 Detroit Tigers World Series team. Uh, Rupert has a new book out we're definitely going to talk about today, Never Give Up. Um, Rupert went through a traumatic brain injury and he shares some of those experiences in his new book, which I'm excited to read very soon. Uh, Well, Rupert, I really appreciate you coming on Sports Untold, also on Rainier Avenue Radio. Thank you very much for having me, Paul. It's a real pleasure. So I want to, I mentioned this to you off the air before we began, and I was with a very, a couple of close friends at a Seattle Kraken hockey game um, a week or so ago. And the, the, the Kraken have a goaltender named Philip Grubauer. And when Grubauer saves a goal, the Kraken fans yell, Grub, Grub, Grub. And one of my good friends, Will, said it reminds me so much in the, the late 70s when Mariners fans chanted, Roop, Roop, Roop. And I said to myself, oh, my gosh, i got to get Rupert Jones on my show. So thanks so much for doing this. Well, thank you for asking. Again, I, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, well, is, Groob, is, is Groob any good? He's good goaltender. He's good. I, I don't know a lot about hockey, but he was a goaltender for the Washington Capitals, I, I believe. And then we brought him into Seattle. So um, he's pretty good. But it's just kind of... The, the memory my friend had and that rekindled with me of um, uh, a, a little similarity when people chanted your name when they when they played. How many how many years ago has that been? 40, 44 years ago? 45, 44 years ago? Well, I yeah, but so many fans remember you well with the Mariners. I was a six seven year old kid, and you were like one of my first introductions to Major League Baseball, Rupert. So a lot of people in my era, we remember you well, and, and uh, you, you still have a lot of uh, admirers in Seattle. Well, thank you very much again. And, uh, you know, it's always good to have people who still remember you, especially after 44 years. I know. We were the original Mariners. It's it's it's, it, it's a, uh, it's a, dis- a distinction that you'll always have. Well, I want to ask you the first question. Why don't you just kind of tell us how you got the baseball bug? How is a young man, kid growing up, how, how did the, the sport of baseball become such a big part of your life? Well, as a kid, I, I played baseball uh, in my neighborhood, in Tyler, Texas. I was the youngest kid in the neighborhood. I played with guys that was two, three, four years older than I was. So can you imagine? I'm a seven, eight-year-old kid playing with 12 and 13-year-olds. I held my own pretty good. And uh, I got better. And, but I left, I, left, I left Texas in 67 when I was 12 and I moved to California. And I didn't play baseball the first year in California, but the following year I played baseball in California. And in California at the time, basketball was, was a popular sport and uh, my school didn't have, have a baseball team. So I played basketball. I started enjoying basketball and I start, I kind of like made basketball my top priority. And I put baseball in the back burner. As a matter of fact, I stopped playing football also because they, you know, they didn't have football until I got to be a freshman. And I played f- football as a freshman. But then again, after that, I didn't play anymore. But I always played summer summer baseball. And uh, I think the talent, the, 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 my athleticism from the other sports kind of like propelled me to be a little better baseball player than I, than I, originally, than I was at one time. So I got better and better. And eventually when it became time for me to make a decision, when I got out of high school, what I wanted to do, I got drafted by the Mar- I mean, I got drafted by the Kansas City Royals in the third round. And that was a no brainer for me. I went to the minor leagues for Kansas City and started playing baseball with Kansas City Royals. Great journey that when you're a young kid at seven, eight years old, playing with kids a lot older than you and holding your own. So I you were a, uh already a future major league player at that time. Can you tell us um, what it was like when you got your first call up to the major leagues? Well, it was July, the last day of July. They, uh, 
I came to the ballpark and manager Billy, uh, and I came in the ballpark and everybody's looking at me. And I said, something's up. And they said, yeah, manager Billy Gordon wants to see you. So I walked into the manager's office kind of reluctantly. And uh, we sat down and talked and he said, you know, we had problems last year. He said, but you told me in spring training that, you know, your problems was, you know, you were, you were injured and you couldn't play as well. He said, and you told me what you was going to do and you did it. He said, I'm here to tell you right now, you did everything that, that you said you was going to do and actually you did more. Consequently, the Kansas City Royals want you in Kansas City tomorrow. So I didn't play that night. I had to go home and pack and and, uh, and find a way and get to Kansas City the next day. And uh, next day I, I pull into Kansas City and I'm in the starting lineup against Gaylord Perry. You were a young guy uh, facing off against a famous pitcher. Yes. Gaylord Perry was my first game. We bring up Gaylord Perry. I, I'm just going to fast forward because I had this question for you later in the interview. I, I'll ask it now. Um, who who was the toughest pitcher you faced in your 11 or 12 years that you played in the major leagues, Rupert? Frank Tanana. When I first came up in 1977, Frank Tanana was was best pitcher I've ever seen. You know, he was left-handed and he threw from the side, and basically he had three pitches he could throw for strikes. He had three power pitches. You know, which is unusual. Some guys have one power pitcher. Some guys might have two. He had three. He had a changeup, he had a curveball, and he had a fastball. And he could throw them all for strikes. And uh, he threw mid-90s to upper-90s as far as velocity was concerned, which, you know, basically you, you, you had to kind of like sit on the pitch versus trying to hit what he threw up through. He was a real talent pitcher. You know, Frank Tanana is a name, Rupert, who was a great pitcher. I don't think he's in the Hall of Fame, though, is he? He's not. He's not. Uh, when he hurt his arm and he, he didn't throw as hard, he still was a productive pitcher because he knew how to pitch. See, that was that was what that was one of the things. When he had his good stuff, he knew how to pitch. Well, when he lost his good stuff, he still knew how to pitch. And I think Frank won about two hundred forty games in the big leagues. That's a great name for the past. A reason why it's fun to talk to a gentleman like you that played when I was growing up in the '70s and '80s to hear a name like Frank Tanana. He had a he was a pretty wicked pitcher. That's a that's a great name. Put it this way: you had a lot of left-handers around the league that when the Frank Tanana pitched, they didn't play that game. We used to call it Tananaitis. Tananaitis. That's a great term. Um, and who was the greatest hitter you saw, Rupert, in your in your years playing in Major League Baseball in the '70s and '80s? Well, I tell people, you know, as far as hitters are concerned, I thought Al Oliver and Julio Franco was two of the best hitters I've ever seen because those gentlemen hit the ball hard all the time. They didn't hit, you know, they didn't hit a lot of home runs, but they hit the ball hard all the time. You know, if they, if they go to plate four times, they hit the ball hard two, three times a game. And they may not get a hit. But they hit the ball hard all the time. Al Oliver and Julio Franco. Those are great players. I don't think either of those guys in the Hall of Fame either. Either uh, are they? Neither one of them are. And Al, Al, and Al would tell you he was a good hitter. <laughs> you know, Al would tell you he's a good hitter because he and he was a darn good hitter. He was a good player. He 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 was like a career three hundred hitter, I think, wasn't he, Al Oliver? Yeah. If he wasn't. He was close. 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 This is Paul Schneiderman, host of the Sports Untold podcast, also on Rainier Avenue Radio with Mariners legend Rupert Jones. And I encourage people on Facebook to like the interview and ask some questions. We're happy to get some some audience questions in today. So what was it like uh, playing for the 77 expansion Mariners? Did you like playing for an expansion team then, Rupert, back in the 77? Well, I was a 22-year-old kid. I was with the Kansas City Raws. And I wasn't going anywhere. I wasn't going to play. I I got picked up in the expansion draft, and all of a sudden, I become a major league everyday major league baseball player. So I really enjoyed uh, the Mariners. The Mariners gave me my uh, the best opportunity that I that, that I that, that, that I could ask for, and that's to play in the big leagues and show everybody that I belong. And uh, so I embraced Seattle. I really enjoyed Seattle the three years I was there. What did you think of the old kingdom? It, it was very criticized, the baseball park. What, what were your experiences playing the kingdom, Rupert? Why was it criticized? 
you got to ask that question. Why was it criticized? Because it was a ball at that particular time in 1977. It was an indoor ballpark and it was a pretty good facility. Of course, you know this is 2021. Things have changed dramatically, but in you know 1977, we had an indoor ballpark. And at that particular time, I don't think they had that many. The Astrodome was one of them. One thing with the Kingdom, Rupert, I'll throw in here is is it did play a huge role in getting the NFL and Major League Baseball to Seattle. So it certainly served a purpose from that standpoint. Well, it rains a lot in Seattle. How are you going to play baseball when it rains all the time? Well, at T-Mobile yeah. Park, we have a roof, a retractable roof. <laughs> so. Oh, see, this, but this is 2021. True. This is, not, this is not 1976. Okay? And by the, by the city having an indoor ballpark, it made way for what's happening today. And speaking of T-Mobile Park, you gentlemen, uh, the Mariners did a fantastic job this year. And I see where you signed Robbie Ray to a to a free agent contract. It was a big deal. We won ninety games last year, but still missed the playoffs. We just we just had these good seasons the last twenty years. We still missed the playoffs too often. So um, we've had a long drought. It's been since two thousand one since the M's have made the playoffs. So we're, we're we're really hungry to get a to have a playoff team. Well, those guys played well down to all the way to the end, to the end. You know, they they played well all the way down to the end, which 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 is a testament to their character. And you know, by bringing in a quality pitcher, and who knows, they might get another quality pitcher. You know, and that's gonna you know that's gonna that's gonna help you. We'll have to see. So, Rupert, you played for several major league teams. You'll always have a soft spot for Seattle. Yes, because it was my first, uh, and. Uh, the Mariners have been really good to me since I've been out of baseball. Also, they, they, you know, they, they always include me in some of the, in a lot of the activities and a lot of the promotions. Uh, I had a chance to go to the, uh, to the fantasy camp this year, but of course, you know, me being in California and me, you know, and I'm not, you know, I, I, I decided not to go. I didn't want to go. I'm 66 years old and I don't, I don't want to be, I, I'm too old to be around baseball. Maybe maybe another point we can get you back up here for an event, but uh, that's that's understandable. So Rupert, when fans yelled enthusiastically, "Roop, Roop, Roop!" like when you're at bat, did you find that helped your performance when the fans uh, shouted your name like that? Well, anytime you appreciate it, it, it means a lot. You know, can you imagine they, they they shout your name before you come on your your podcast? It doesn't when happen very have... often, <laughs> <laughs> or at all, or at all. You know, so. but you would get juiced up, wouldn't you? Could if, get if, a little if, pumped up. Yeah, I'm not yeah. expecting it though. So if you if you had a big roar that says you know that that, that, that yells to scream your name. Remember it well. Remember it well, the old kingdom. You were definitely a fan favorite. Made the All Stars back in '77. I, a, a little trivial pursuit question there. You were the first Mariners uh, All Star member, and uh, there, there, you had some good years there. Hey, so Rupert, when you played for the Mariners, the Mariners, one of the Mariners' part owners is the late actor Danny Kay, a famous Hollywood actor. Did you get to know Danny Kay at all? I got to I got to meet him on a few occasions. Uh, he was a great man. Uh, he uh, he he invested in the ball club that that, that, that a, a few years earlier didn't make it in Seattle, but he took a chance with uh, with some other people and he brought baseball to, C, uh, to Seattle. Seattle he should he should have a, a place in Seattle's heart. You thought he was he, a nice man. Yes, he was. Yeah. Did you ever run across another Mariners owner, uh, part owner Walter Schoenfeld? Do you remember Walter at all? Does that I name ring a bell? I don't remember him. Okay, he was. I knew him a little bit. He actually lived. lived uh, he passed a few years ago, but he lived in my Seattle neighborhood. He was a very nice man too. But Danny Kay was a big name, big name owner that the Mariners had back then. Yeah. Um, are you in touch with those players from those late seventies Mariners teams at all? I, basically, when I came home from baseball, I kind of like came home and you know, and and I I got a different life, and I I I didn't really keep in keep in contact with baseball. I lost my contact with baseball altogether. Uh, I was a single dad for a long time, taking care of two kids, and uh, I just baseball was not was not something that I gravitated back towards. I, I had an opportunity to get back in the game as as a, as, a, as a minor league coach, but I decided not to. Chapter in your life, and there's new chapters in our lives, aren't there? Yes, there are. 
And chances are, if I'd have got back into baseball, I might not have been what I am today. All sorts, sure. all sorts of ways of looking at life decisions. Yes. Uh, if I can pick your brain for a minute, Rupert, do you have any thoughts at all on the uh, Major League Baseball lockout situation? Any any thoughts on how the owners and players can maybe come to an agreement at all? I, I don't follow baseball enough to be educated on the, on the issues that are separating. What are the issues that are separating? Well, my understanding, there's some issues with uh, maybe getting the Players Association wants to get younger players paid more. I think they want to change some of the arbitration rules, just things like that. That's what I've been reading. So um, get the younger paid, get the younger players paid more, paid paid more, or quicker. I think that's part of it, getting them paid. When I think, I think the free eight, I think the union wants to liberalize the free agency rules. You know, I think that, I think that, uh, oh, just a whole whole combination of issues. I think the universal DH is coming up as well. You know, I, there's uh, there's talk about that in the collective bargaining. So I'm just giving, just based on what I'm reading. So how do you feel, how do you feel about how do you feel about the universal DH? Well, I want to ask you about that. Um, I had on the Mariners broadcaster Dave Sims last week, and Dave is a big supporter of the Universal DH. Um, you know, I'm conflicted about it. I want to get your opinion. I, I mean, there's so much strategy in the National League, wh- whether a pitcher should hit or not. But overall, I kind of like having no, it. No, no, is that strategy, whether the pitcher should hit or not? Is that strategy? They're going to pitch five, six innings anyway. Okay. So consequently, you're not going to have decisions that, that, that that's going to be monumental. Uh, I think the universal DH can what 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 serve a couple of problems. I mean, serve a couple of, serve, serve, serve a couple of things. Number one, the pitcher won't have to hit. Nobody comes to the ballpark to see the pitcher hit. They come to see the pitcher pitch. That's number one. Number two, you get you keep you you know you 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 lower the chances of your pitcher getting hurt. Trying to hit or trying to run the base. That's a good point. Again, I want my pitcher to get hurt pitching. I don't want to get him hurt hitting or running the bases because I don't pay him to hit and run the bases. Number three, a lot, a lot of those designated hitter jobs, good veteran players fill those fill those slots. So you you know you may see a little you may see a, a good veteran ball player a little longer play a little longer or 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 or. or, or, or or is back into the game, okay? Or you can use the DH in, in, in so many different ways. But to have one league have a DH and another league not have a DH, the American League teams are always going to be at a disadvantage if the if, if the National League doesn't have DH because they mean the American League pitchers got a hit when they play in playing National League ballparks. All excellent points, and you played the game and you know the game well too. So those are you asked the guy, or you got a superstar pitcher. He don't he don't hit and all of a sudden he got to go to home plate and hit, okay? He don't run the bases. All of a sudden he has to run the bases, so he has to be another kind of a, a, a of a player. Now some a lot of National League pitchers, yeah, they're used to it, so you know they're more acclimated. What if there was a rule, Rupert? I'm just brain, having fun brainstorming with you, Paul Schneider. I'm in a Sports Untold podcast, or any other already with, with uh, baseball legend Rupert Jones. I'm just brainstorming with you, Rupert. What if there was a rule where if a team had a good a pitcher who could hit well, like Steve Carlton was a pretty good hitting pitcher, where they could maybe DH the shortstop or DH the catcher. Would you support a rule like that, where if a, where if a team wanted to have the pitcher hit, they could have the pitcher hit? Well, if if the pitcher is a good hitter, they can just put him in the lineup. When he, you know, they can just put it like Otani. I'm sure Otani would be would would be a a, a a a hitter and a player when he pitches. But what happens when he come out the game? You lose your DH. Right. I just thought of Otani. You read my mind. So, yeah. He, but he, you know, he's proven that he can do both of them. And when he pitches, yeah, he hits, he still hits. That's fine and dandy. But when he comes out the game, you lose the DH. All your points are valid. Otani, he has to be one of the, uh, the most colorful and, and great players ever. I mean, just what he can do. He's a pretty incredible guy, isn't he? He's a fantastic player. Do you think he's the MVP of the American League? Um, there may be a good argument for it. He's so multi-dimensional. Who won the MVP, by the way? He won it, didn't he? I think Otani won. I have to check. I may have to Google that in a second. But he, he was... Trout was what, injured a lot last year, I think. What place were the Angels in? 
Uh, they were towards the bottom of the AL West last year, weren't they? Yes. Yeah. So, in other words, the most valuable player is a player that is, is, is valuable. Okay? To me, uh, he's valuable. Uh, 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 a, a player who who's on a fourth-place team, they could have came in fourth place without him. Do you think that uh, Toronto could have competed all year with, 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 with without Vladimir Guerrero? Lots, lots of stuff there. You bring up, a, you make an interesting point. How to define the most valuable player, too, Rupert? I, I see where you're going. And, and if, if someone is on a last place team, are they really the most valuable player in the league? Is that part of your point? He's on a last place team. The team could have came in last place without his numbers. Okay, I'm gonna play devil's advocate. Maybe they could have been 15 games worse without him. <laughs> so. They still in last place. True, true. True. Okay, 15 games worse, whatever. They're still in the last place. Now, a player of the year, okay. But the most valuable player, is, it, it should be a, a, a player who's on a winning team should get rewarded. I think that's a great point for all sports leagues that you just brought yeah. up. Yeah. So, if some guy's averaging 35 points a game for an NBA team that wins 25 games, you know, I, I get where your, where your point is, you know, so... Well, you know, can he add twenty? Can he add thirty-five points for a first-place team? He has to make the, you know, he has to bring the team player up. Well, he played on a good, bad team. I know that's not his fault, but it's not. You you can't penalize the guy who's on a good team because he's on a good team. You you can't penalize him either. And his team probably couldn't win if he wasn't there producing. You got me thinking. I'm going to ask some future guests that question about how to define the most valuable player. You, 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 you're actually helping me create uh, a topic uh, for, for some future guests as well. So there's a lot there. Well, Rupert, you have a new book out that I want to talk to you about called Never Give Up. And um, I want you to, to share it with the, with the listeners. And why don't you just tell us a little bit, a little bit about the book and what, what your general message of your uh, biography, Never Give Up, is about. Well, I'm disappointed you didn't read the book. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. I, 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 I can't wait to read it. I, 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 I work as an attorney. I'm making an excuse. I, 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 <laughs> I, 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 did, I did have a, I had an arbitration hearing all day yesterday. I'm making all these excuses. I haven't read your book yet, but I do want to read it. So I feel guilty, though. So, you haven't? You uh, haven't? I have not ordered it yet, but I fully intend to read it. I just haven't got to it yet. Um, okay. I, I, I feel bad. I'm, I'm probably letting you down, but I I. I do encourage people to read your book, and I'm going to read it too. Uh, as a matter of fact, I got it. I got it right here. Thanks for sharing it. Let's talk about your book. What's the main message of your biography? The main message of my biography: I uh, in 1980, I suffered a head injury while playing with the New York Yankees. I ran into a center field, to the left center field wall in Oakland, California. Uh, I was knocked unconscious. And the trainer at the time was Gene Monahan. And, uh, you know, unbeknownst to me is I, I stopped breathing. Wow. I, didn't, I never knew that until 30 years later when I read an article that he, that, uh, uh, a, a newspaper article with Gene Monahan. And, and, and he was asked when he was re retired, uh, uh, Mr. Monahan, what was the worst injury you ever attended to? And he said, Rupert Jones, he ran into the wall in Oakland chasing the fly ball. He said, before we can get him off the field, we had to get him to breathe again. Now, I didn't hear this to 2011, 2012. Oh, gosh. Now, I suffered in the, in the 80s dramatically, you know, in the 90s from, uh, from things from TBI, traumatic brain injury. And... Uh, that, that, that's consistent with football players and their, and, and their concussions. Again, I didn't find this out until uh, 2010. I, I, I knew I was scuffling with something in the, 80, in the 90s, in the 80s and the 90s, even in the early 2000s. But I, knew, I didn't know what it was. But I scuffled with something. And I, I sought, sought psychiatric, you know, it took me a while before I started seeking psychiatric help. Uh, Start getting, start taking medication, things of that nature to kind of like help me. And finally, I found out in 20, 2010, 2011. And I, then I started going 
crazy with researching. Of course, with the internet and Google, you can get all, you can get all this information now. So I was getting a lot of information on it. And after a few years, I, I decided, I'm going to write a book. And uh, I wrote my book with pencil and paper. I didn't write it with like you like you guys do on the computer and everything. I wrote it with pencil and paper. That's incredible in this era that you did that. My wife would, my wife would, 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 would transcribe for me and we put it on the computer. You know, but that's how I, that's how I wrote it. It took me six, seven years. But it took me that long to, get, to kind of like gather the information and also to put the story together. I you know, I I I, I put it in a chronological order from when I was a young kid in Tyler, Texas, till I was a 60 something year old man in San Diego, California. San Diego is a great town. I have some cousins in your town, great place. Have you formally been diagnosed with, um, with what is it, CTI? Do I have the right term? Do, have you been diagnosed with that particular condition? I've gone through the gamut of, 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 of tests and the test revealed uh, my, my my psychological evaluation revealed a lot of important information. I talk about it. I talk about it in the book candidly. The book, you know, I'm as honest as I can be in the book. I read about memoirs, and I and it one of the biggest things it said is, be honest. So I wrote an honest story. Uh, I got a co-author, Ryan Dempsey, great, great, great. He did a great job with us. Uh, I told Ryan when we first met, I liked him. I had met a few people and I liked him. I said, I think I want I want to work with you. I said, but the one thing that I'm, I'm I, I want I want this book to sound like me. I don't want this book to sound like you talking. I want the people to know that this is coming from me. So he he said, okay. He looked at the book. He read it. He said, okay, I want you to. Go through it, rewrite it. Okay. So I went through it, rewrote it. I changed a few things. I added some, took some out, and I got a little bit more information from another source that was applicable. He read it and got together. He made his little changes. He said, okay, I want you to write it again. So we went through it again. And of course we made some changes. And we gave it, got it, gave it back to him. He went through it, made changes, kind of cleaned up the you know, there's some grammar and everything. He said, "Okay, I want you to write it one more time." We wrote, we wrote, we rewrote it three times. It's a lot of work, Rupert, putting your book together. It was worth it because new information kept coming to me, and new. New insight, you know, my you know my memory ain't the best in the world. So new 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 insight were coming to me, and new 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 things was happening that I could add to the story, which was good. You know, I could add new you know, some different things to it. Like in 2019, we we had our anniversary, uh, 35th anniversary for the Tigers baseball team. See, if I hadn't wrote it three times, I wouldn't have got to, I couldn't have got that much into the book. And uh, the third time was the third time was the was was the PF, you know was was it? Third time is a charm. I'm going to ask you in a few minutes about the '84 for Tigers World Series team. So you, it, it seems like you've made a lot of progress in recent years with your traumatic brain injury condition. Yes, as a matter of fact, subconsciously I was doing a lot of things that were that were that were good for my for my brain injury. But then I was able to do more once I learned, 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 learned you know, learned more about it. I was able to do, to do more, which again helped me, and it also made me not made me not be so self conscious about my situation because before you think you're crazy, and you know, you know, you don't want people, you don't want to tell people you, you, you know, you're crazy. But once you find out what's wrong with you, 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 you get a better handle on the situation. Uh, when I first wrote the book, my title was going to be I Am Not Alone. Because of the mere fact that for so many years I felt alone. But my wife kept coming, she came up with a handle called hashtag never give up for my Twitter 2018. And I kept saying, you know, never give up is more appropriate title because 
I never, you know, I could have gave up. There were many, there were many times when I wanted to give up on life. I wanted to give up, but something kept me going. Something kept me going. I struggled. I, I struggled dramatically, and I talk about my struggles in the book. You know, I talk about my struggles. I talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. You feel a lot more at peace, it seems like now, Rupert. Than how uh, yes, you I am. Yes, I am. I'm at peace now. You know, for, I live with a lot of regret. I live with a lot of guilt because of, because of a lot of things I've done. But after learning about my condition, my condition had a lot to do with that because my the, the, uh, my you know the, a lot of things that I did was 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 uh, compatible with a lot of things with people who have traumatic brain injuries what they would do how they how how, how they behave. What what kind of advice do you give people, Rupert, who are going through uh, traumatic brain injury? You have, do you have any uh, general feedback you give people who are who have dealt with the condition that you've dealt with? Okay, when I first when I first suffered in the eighties and nineties, of course, I didn't know what I had. So of course, you got a feeling of being alone. You got a feeling of not being able to tell people because you don't want to tell people that you're crazy at that particular time in the eighties and nineties. Well, this is the 2000, 2000, you know, 10, 2020, things are different. People are more tolerant of, 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 of individuals now that have head injuries, that suffer from traumatic brain injuries. So, that, you know, so consequently, they can seek help and they can seek treatment to make themselves better. I've talked to a lot of people that says, man, your book really helped me out a lot, you know, because I suffer from some of the things that you talked about, you know, and they, you know, they're able to seek help because now they're not afraid to. And that's so important. Rupert, we hear a lot about the, the traumatic brain injury issue in professional football. Uh, we don't hear about it as much in Major League Baseball. Do you think Major League Baseball is doing enough? And I include the Players Association as question. Is Major League Baseball doing enough to address the traumatic brain injury issue and players such as yourself who who have faced that uh, diagnosis. Well, it's not as prevalent in baseball though. See, I had a I had an accident where I ran into the wall and lost consciousness. You know, you don't see too many baseball players lose consciousness on the field. Justin Marneau did. He had problems with with, 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 with he had problems with, with vertigo and a couple other things. Okay, and his you know, and that's how I really I started really following and finding out things. That's because Justin Marneau slid into the second baseman's knee and he was out of baseball for a long time. And I'm saying to myself, I ran into a wall. Maybe some of the things that I have experienced or, or I dealt with is in conjunction with this, with, you know, with, with, with that, with that accident or uh, Kirby Puckett, he got beamed in the, you know, he got beamed in the head, of course, the eye, but well, that's the head, the brain is right there. And I understand, I know I wrote a little bit about Curry Puckett in the book that you might want, you know, that's, that's there. I'm not going to tell you any more about it. Uh, Tony Conigliaro, another baseball player in the 60s, the great hitter with the Boston Red Sox, young kid. He got beamed, and his career took a dive. Remember Adam Greenberg, that rookie that Dusty Baker put in on the first pitch he got hit in the head? Remember that? Um, came how about a decade ago, 15 years ago, I think. Yeah, I don't remember that. Yeah. Well, all right. What happened to him? I don't think he ever really was the same. I don't think he. I don't know if he ever played major league baseball. It was like the first pitch, and he got hit. Um, just got walloped by a, a fastball and was out. It was very yeah. sad. Very sad. Um, Rupert, in your book, what's the most impactful story you have about your major league baseball career? Was there any like one story that stands out that you really love sharing in your book? If I tell you my story, then you won't read, you won't buy the book. <laughs> oh, no, I want to read it. I'm going to read it. I promise you, I'll read it. But okay, I got a story. Okay. 2012. I had been with my wife for 15 years. I told my wife about Nolan Ryan when we met in, in 1997. You know, we talked. You know, we were together, and I told her about Nolan Ryan. I said Nolan Ryan was a fierce competitor. He's one of the toughest pitchers that I've ever faced in my whole career. And uh, I was telling him how, you know, how, com how, how competitive he was. I said, when you face Nolan Ryan, your whole body is on, is, is on alert. 
is tingling. It's on alert because he could knock your, he could punch your lights out at any time. Well, I met Nolan, we met with, in 2012, fast forward, we was in Austin, Texas at the airport. We see Nolan Ryan with his wife. So I go up to Nolan Ryan, so Nolan Ryan, Rupert Jones. He looked at me like he didn't know who I was. And my wife is sitting right there and I'm kind of, I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of like, oh man, I'm embarrassed a little bit because I've been telling about Nolan Ryan all these years and then I see him and he don't recognize me. So we walking in the security line. He came to me and said, you had a home run off me. I said, that was 30 years ago. You still remember that? He said, yeah, and I'm still mad about it. And uh, that was probably one of my best best stories because at that particular time, I was kind of like coming out of the trend. You know, I was, that, that's when I started putting my book together and I realized that, you know, hey, I was a pretty good player. Absolutely. A famous pitcher sure remembered you, Rupert. So, yes, so. he struck out 5,500 hitters, okay? And then a few days later, I'm throwing out the first pitch in, 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 in a, at a, at a, it was, it was safe court at the time. And the Mariners are playing the Chicago White Sox. So I go out on the field and I talk to Chris Shamless, the betting coach. Chris played for the Yankees and I, I played against him in, uh, you know, in, in New York. I played against him when he was at the Braves. And uh, so we was talking. Harold Baines comes up. Great player. Yes. Harold Baines comes up and says, hey, Chris, he hit a ball out of Comiskey. And Chris, Chris looked at me and said, what? He said, Harold said, he hit the ball out of Comiskey. I said, that's right. You were there that night, wasn't you? He said, yeah. And, uh, and then uh, I, t I told him what happened. I said, yeah. I said, I gave my Tom Seaver story then. Tom Siebel had broken about three or four of my bats prior to me facing him this particular time. I faced Tom Siever in 1981. I hit a double the first time I faced him off the left center field wall. The next time up, he broke my bat with a cut fastball. I saw him again uh, in, at that same game, I think. He threw me, or, or another game, he threw me a cut fastball and broke a bat. So now, fast forward three years later, he's with the White Sox, and I'm with the Tigers, and the first time up, he throws me that cut fastball, and he breaks my back. So I come back to the dugout. Larry Herndon has a 35-35. It's a big bat. And it's bigger than the bat I got. I said, Larry, let me use your bat. He said, what you going to do with it? I said, I'm going to use it on Tom Seaver. He said, how you going to use it? He going to break this one, too. I said, Larry, let me use the bat. So I had a bigger bat and I go to the plate and he throws that cut fastball. He didn't get it in close enough and I hit it. And when I hit it, I said, yes, I got him. And I looked up and I said, that's going in the second deck. And then all of a sudden the ball just disappeared into the night. Left the whole ballpark. Fun stories, hearing about Tom Seaver and Nolan Ryan. It's just, it's just a lot of fun. Paul Schneiderman, host of the Sports Untold podcast, also on Radio Ever Radio, with baseball legend and an original Seattle Mariners member, Rupert Jones. Rupert, I asked these two questions to pretty much all my guests since about late 2019, and I get great answers. My first question for you is, who's a deceased sports figure in history you would have loved to have chatted with or interviewed? And who's a living sports figure? you would love to have a conversation or interview with? You know, I, I never met Hank Aaron. I, in my 11 years I played, I never met Hank Aaron. I never got really? a chance to talk to him. Yeah, I never got a chance to talk to him. But I always thought that he was the best hitter to ever play baseball. Okay, in my estimation, Hank Aaron is the best putter, hitter to ever play baseball. And people would ask, say, well, how do you say that? I said, all you got to do is look at the history books. His name is at the top in all the, in all the categories. In all the main categories, his name's at the top. He's in the top five. No doubt. And there's nobody else. Name is in all the top five uh, uh, main uh, main offensive categories in the Hank Aaron. So he's the deceased sports person you would have loved to have chatted with and spent some time with Hank Aaron. Uh, yes, 
Definitely. Great answer. I think a couple other guests mentioned Hank Aaron as well, and he sadly passed this year. And one thing with Hank Aaron that would have been fascinating to talk to him about is when all the prejudice he faced in the 70s when he was chasing Babe Ruth's record. It would have been just interesting to hear him have a sit down with him about some of those issues he went through. Yeah, but you know what? He's a pioneer. He's the reason why the game is the way it is today and black players had a chance to play it because, because of him, you know? He overcame all that. And and he was able to compartmentalize all of that and still produce at a high level. You got guys now that can, you know, I had trouble sometimes playing. But he had to, he, you know, he had to, he, he had to separate all these different issues and still perform. Those are he, great points. And Jackie Robinson, of course, went through a lot of that, those same issues. Great Jackie points. Robinson. Yeah. Did you ever well, meet Jackie? Did you ever meet Jackie? I never met Jackie. I never met Jackie. Uh, Hank, I never met Hank. Great but I names. Thought he, I, I thought he was the, the best hitter ever, ever played baseball. I, I love that name. Who, who's a living sports figure, um, Rupert? This It could be a manager, a player, an owner that you just love to have a sit down with. Any sport, whether it's tennis, basketball, baseball, football, whatever. Bill Belichick. Okay. Bill Belichick is, is, is a fantastic football coach, period. Okay. He has a solid philosophy, and, 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 and when you go to New England, the prisoners know who run the asylum. Certain teams, they don't. They might not have. They might not know who run the asylum, but he know, he runs the asylum. And he has a he, he has a basic formula with guys. And I watch I watch them play, and I, I'm just fascinated how they play. And he always tell them, just do your job. Just do your job. And, and, you know, and that's one of the hardest things that people can understand because everybody wants to do the great play, make the great play and do the great thing. But football is the ultimate team game. So if everybody do their job, the play gets, you know, the play gets ran right. OK, because you, you know, you, you are where you're supposed to be. You're not supposed, you know, you're not where you're not supposed to be. Another Bill guest Belichick. mentioned Bill Belichick. You're the second guest to answer Bill answer the name Bill Belichick to that question. And he's a great strategist and tactician, isn't he, Coach Belichick? He just said, "Do your do, do your job." I mean, how, how, how simple you you are a player, okay? You're looking to be great and you want to make all the great plays. But he just said, "Hey, I just want you to do your job." I didn't ask you to go. I didn't ask you to be over there. I asked you to be right here. You know, that's the other guy's responsibility to be there. That's a good name. Who was the favorite manager you played under, Rupert? Oh, Dick Williams. I played for Dick Williams. Dick Williams is probably my favorite because he taught me, he's the first manager that really taught me that I didn't know nothing about baseball. Okay? I didn't know anything about baseball until I started playing with him. He was real character, wasn't he, Dick Williams? Well, he was He was a, He was was a. a manager that had a, he had a, he had a way of playing the game, too. He had a simple way to play the game. You get him a guy on second base and no outs, get him a third. And you know he he understood that you, you know you're not gonna do it every time, but he wants you to try. Okay, you got a man on third base and less than two outs. He wants you to get him in. He don't care how you get him in. Bunt, roll the ball down the second base, hit a fly ball, get a base hit, get the run in. And he didn't like walks. He hated walks. Man, hated walks. He said, I can't defense a walk. He's the first guy I heard. He said, I can't defense a walk. And when he said that, I understood right away what he meant. Because if you watch a baseball game, guys who walk, let's say the leadoff hitter, if he walks, he scores 30, 35% of the time. Now, if he gets on with a base hit, it's different. That number, don't, that number is not as high. But if you walk him, he, that number is higher. I didn't know that. That's an interesting statistic. Oh, yeah. You start putting people on base, man. What's the biggest problem in Colorado? Putting people on base. Because of the altitude. You walk people. You got to make people get hit. You got to make people hit to get on base. That's why when you get to the playoffs in the World Series, who wins the game? The team with the best pitch. There's a lot there. At the end of the day, it's the team with the best, who pitches the best. I read Dick Williams' biography years ago, and he did not have a great experience in Seattle. 
That was like the one managerial experience he had that didn't really work out very well. I remember reading that years ago. But what a, what a great name you mentioned. What year was he there? He was in Seattle, I think, about 86 to 88. And he was a big hire, but it just didn't it didn't quite work out. But he he mentioned he didn't care for the Americans owner that much, and but he you know he's very outspoken. Is, well, you know you do Dick Williams obviously. I never knew him, but he was very very blunt in his biography. He really really let a lot rip in his book. Well, I guess you are gonna say I'm blunt too. Then I let a lot I let a lot in my in my biography too. I let, you know, but well, Dick Dick was an honest man, and sometimes when your honesty can be mis misconstrued as blunt, but the truth is a lot of time blunt. Right, right. Very true. Very true. Okay. Very true. I want. That's, that's what people don't. I know. That's what I understand. People don't like that because they don't want to hear the truth, and the truth is blunt, and it's it it it, 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 it cuts them a little bit. Well, your title of your book, "Never Give Up," is a blunt title, Rupert. That's a very direct, blunt title. You know, so never give up. Never give up. Yeah, yeah. Which I encourage people to read. And would you sign it for me if I if I when I get a copy? I would give you my P.O. box where you can send it to me. Oh, I, I should say that because everybody going to want to do that, huh? <laughs> you can get your P.O. box here. I, I, I but, uh, but you don't have to if you don't want to. But I'd love you. I love you to sign the book for me at some point. I would. So. I, I would sign your book. Yes, sir. Very honored. Very honored to have your your uh, your autograph. Um, I got a couple more questions for you, if you don't mind, Rupert. Um, that '84 Detroit Tigers team that you got a World Series ring, really neat. And the team won 104 games and had players such as yourself and Alan Trammell, Lou Whitaker, Jack Morris, Lance Parrish, Kurt Gibson. That's kind of an underrated great World Series championship team, isn't it? That 84 Detroit Tigers team. I don't know if we underrated it or not. You know, maybe because we didn't do it, uh, we, you know, we didn't do it in mo multiple times. But in 1984, eh, we did something special. Uh, I can I, I I talk about this in the book. In 1984, I was a free agent, and uh, I got no offers to play baseball. Pittsburgh calls me up two days before spring training starts, and they want me to be in spring training. Now I I, I got to spend one day traveling because I'm in California, so I get there, and I go to spring training with the, with the Pirates as a non-rostered player. Now, as a non rusted player, I was playing A games and B games. So I would play the B games in the morning at 9, 10 o'clock in the morning, and then I would get in my car or get in the car and get go over to the, to, the, to the big complex and play in the A games in the afternoon. I got to work with Willie Stodger, the great Willie Stodger in the morning. Yeah. yeah, he was our, he was our, he was our head, you know, he ran that B game teams. And so I, I, I got to work with him. I was playing twice a day, but I, you know, I probably the best spring training I ever had. I was, and I, and, and I produced the spring training. I was hitting about 340 in, in the middle of the month. And Chuck Tanner comes to me and said, Rupert, you have done everything that we, we could ask. He said, but you haven't hit any home runs. You know, we got to see if you got the power. And I said, wow. I didn't, I didn't even think about that. So the next day we go over to Clearwater, play the Phillies. First time up, I hit a home run. Two days later, we go over to Orlando, play the Twins. Second time up, I hit a home run. So it was Monday, I hit a home run. Wednesday, I hit a home run. Friday, we in uh, Bradenton. I play a B game in the morning. And then I Catch, you know, then I come over there and I get in the I get in the eighth game of, in the eighth inning as, as a pinch hitter. I hit a home run, so I've hit three home runs in, in in three in three four five days. Not too shabby. So as I run around third, as I come around third base, Chuck Taylor looks at me and smiles and you know really smiles. And I, you know, I said okay, I've done what you know I've I've shown him. A couple of days later, he calls me into his office and he says, Rupert. This is the toughest thing I've ever had to do in baseball. He said, you've done everything we asked you to do and more. He said, but I can't keep you. We have too many. We got too many guys with contracts that we can't get rid of. So I can't keep you. And I, he said, this is the hardest thing I, 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 I've ever had to do in baseball. I said, Chuck, I just thank you for the opportunity. 
you know, thank you for the opportunity. Well, I thought maybe I would get a job because of what I've done down in spring training. Well, no job was coming, no, no, no job came. So I went home to California in mid April, my agent calls me. He says, you'll never guess who's interested in you. I said, Hey, I don't want to play no games, man. I just want to go play baseball. Cause I had been home by three weeks, four weeks, three weeks, four weeks. He said, the Detroit Tigers want you to go to AAA and play for them in AAA. I said, Detroit Tigers? I said, aren't they 15 and old? <laughs> they don't need me. He said, they want you to go to spring training, I mean, go to, go to minor leagues. I said, okay. Nobody else was calling. He said, but we're going to sign a contract that says that you have to be in the big leagues by June 1st. If you're not in the big leagues by June 1st, you could opt out of this contract. I said, it's fine. So I go to, I go to spring training. Mean, I go to uh, Evansville, Indiana. Tiger Triple H site. And I played. I hadn't played in a month. So, you know, th three weeks, four weeks. So I was kind of, I was struggling at first. But I, I, I picked up my game and I started hitting. And I started hitting. And I was playing very well. Around May 27th, 28th, the Tigers come back, you know, my agent comes back to me. He says, Rupert, he said, you know, the 1st of June, you can opt out this contract. And the Tigers know that. See, the Tigers have asked me, would you mind extending your time for a few days and give them opportunity to make roster moves? And he said, but I got good news. He said, I got four teams that's interested in you and they want you right now. I said, well, my agent was Dick. I said, Dick, nobody called me in April. You know, I said, Detroit called me. Nobody else called me. Nobody else gave me a chance. They gave me a chance. I said, I'll wait until they make a roster move. I'll give them a chance to make a roster move. June 5th, I was in the big leagues. They had me in the big leagues by June 5th. And uh, they welcomed me. It was a great, it was, it was a great team. They, they, they welcomed me. I was able to help them a lot. But they helped me a lot also. I saw how baseball could be the, the greatest, the, 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 the greatest thing ever. I played with guys that were warriors. You know, we had a team full of warriors, man. Jack Morris. Kurt Gibson, Trammell, Whitaker, Chet Lemon, Lance Parrish, you know, the backbone of the ball club, and then the and then the guys that were our extra men. We 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 fought tooth and nails every night. Not every other night, every night. When you came to play us, if you wasn't coming to war, you couldn't win. You weren't gonna win. You had to come to war. Like a football team, kind of those '84 Tigers. You know, Rupert. Yeah. One thing you shared that I, a part of the story that that I think is a life theme there is that one door may close, but a more exciting and meaningful door can open. So, with what happened, I mean, I think there's a little, a little, a little message there, isn't there? Paul, it's something I learned about life. If something bad happened to you. Get over it because guess what? Something good is around the corner. So you have to prepare yourself for what's coming around the corner because what's coming around the corner is probably better than what you got. I, you know, and ironically, it's happened to me so many times. Or I've had some bad fortune or I've had some bad luck, and all of a sudden, bam, something happened to me that I would never have thought happened, but happened, it was better. Okay. How we deal with life circle my book is about about this too how we deal with what happened to us is very important it's not it's not the most the most important thing is not what happens to you it's how you deal with what happened to you just a real powerful story there that you got released i believe by the pirates and then you ended up playing for detroit and having a championship ring later that year it's just it's it's really quite a story um lou whitaker hey, Paul, uh, yeah Paul, wait, wait till you hear wait, wait till you read the rest of them in here i'm looking forward to it never give up i want my listeners to re, uh purchase mr jones's book never give up paul schneiderman 
host of Sports Untold podcast, also on Rainier Avenue Radio with uh, the great uh, Major League Baseball player, uh, Rupert Jones. Rupert, I want to ask you another question, too, if you don't mind, if I get a couple more questions, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I want to ask you about uh, Lou Whitaker. His name comes up a lot as a potential Hall of Famer. Do you think Lou has a good Hall of Fame case? Well, how do they judge the Hall of Fame? Trevor, 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 Trevor Hoffman wasn't even, he wasn't even elected on the first ballot. He wasn't elected his first, you know, his first, when, when he was, when, when he was up for the Hall of Fame, they wouldn't even, they wouldn't even vote him in the first time he was eligible. Why not? You got six, you got 600 saves. Now, you tell me how many guys got 600 saves in baseball. Rivera, come on, is that about it? You got two guys that got 600 saves. Right, right. The first guy that gets 600 saves is not in the Hall he, he does not go first. He, he, he's not first ballot in the Hall of Fame. Doesn't so make sense that? to you then. Yeah. Don Sutton. Don Sutton struck out over 3,000 hitters. He had over 300 wins. How long, did, how long did it take for him to get in the Hall of Fame? Long time. And that's crazy. Yeah. Well he, well, he pitched a lot of years. But guess what? Ain't not many guys in the Hall of Fame didn't pitch a lot or play a lot of years because you can't be in the Hall of Fame unless you play a lot of years and put up a lot of numbers. You know, Nolan Ryan still got five thousand hitters. He, how many years did he play? Twenty. So, I don't know what their criteria is. It, it's very open-ended, isn't it, how they how the writers evaluate. Plus, they have those veterans committees. I was talking to Dave Sims, the Mariners broadcaster, but we had some Hall of Fame talk recently, and I had Shannon Dreyer, another Mariners broadcaster, and we got some Hall of Fame talk in. But, yeah, Lou Whitaker's name comes up as someone that a lot of people think has a good Hall of Fame case. Um, how, many, how many years did it take for Erica to get to the Hall of Fame? Like the 10th year, he finally got in. Right, right, right. We're talking about one of the greatest Ryan Hillers that, you know, to play in his, in his era. Well, a lot of people don't like the DH. There was a bias a lot of the writers had, right? Wasn't that part of it? The writers, they had to go out there and play. Yeah, I know. Guys like you that play know more about than the writers do. You know, so. you, know you all you got to do is ask pitchers. <laughs> Just ask pitchers. What was it like playing for Sparky Anderson? Sparky Anderson was a great manager, a great individual, great man. He ran that, he, he ran that Tiger team as well as you can run a ball club. Okay. He was very consistent with his strategy and how he thought. You could think along with him. You know, when you when, when the game got to a certain situation, you knew your number, you knew you had an idea when your numbers would come up. You didn't have to guess where am I going. No, you knew you, you had an idea when your numbers gonna come up. So everybody on the bench was ready. Our bench players were always ready because they knew that Sparky had a situation for him. Were he and Dick Williams similar as managers? No. Different styles. Different styles, but they emphasize the little things the winning, and the winning baseball. What was the favorite team you played on, the 84 Tigers? 84 Tigers. Really enjoyed that group, plus you guys won it all. Well, when you win, that's what you play for. When you win, it's a, you can't wait to get to the ballpark. And they beat the, the Tigers beat the Padres you later played for. There's a little interesting twist there because now you're in San Diego. And you played for the well, Padres. Actually, I played for San Diego, and then I played for Detroit. I, you know, I had been a free agent when, uh, in my after my third year in San Diego. Of course, that was in the that was the beginning of my of my of my of my of my, of my issues. You know, I you know that a lot of uh, my issues started in 1980, but they progressively gotten worse. But they were they were they were pretty bad in in the early 80s too. Well, it seems like you've come a long way right now. Um, and you went and played in Japan for a year. How was it playing for the Hanshin Tigers? I've been to Japan once. They sure love baseball there, don't they? They love baseball there. They, I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was a nice experience. I was at, I was at the, I was at the end of my career. I was at the end of my career, and I was just playing for because I needed the money. And anytime you start playing for you because you need the money, it's, it's, it's really time to go. Uh, I was not having a, I was not having fun playing the game anymore. My production had just went down, and basically, I was I was really struggling at that particular time as far as my mental health was concerned. I was I was struggling mentally also. I was struggling mentally real bad. That was like the eighth year, 
in, in into my into my uh, after my brain you know after my brain, initial brain injury. A challenging yeah. part of your life. Did you like the Japanese culture? Did you enjoy? Did you enjoy exploring Japan at all when you were there? I I enjoyed myself in Japan. I enjoyed the Japanese culture. Uh, but, you know what little bit I that, that, that I got to observe. Uh, I would recommend you know, if anybody would. I would recommend anybody who who who, you know, who still wants to play baseball and they get opportunity to play in Japan. Go to Japan. Have the opportunity to play there. Uh, I was there five years ago on University of Washington tour group, and um, one thing about Japan, Rupert, that I couldn't get over is how much pride they take in the food preparation, like the display of the food in Japan. They take so much pride in how they oftentimes uh, display the food, like with the sushi and those dishes. I, I noticed that when I was there. They, they, it, it, anyhow, but... Uh, and you know what? That, and you, it's, it's strange that you mentioned that, uh, but uh, when I first got there, they would always have big meals before the game. I mean, right? You know, they take batting practice and then they come in and have meals. I said, man, how you guys gonna play? You know <laughs> yeah. You know, it's hard never, to eat. It's hard to it's hard to do anything after a big meal sometimes. But but they they fed you pretty well over there then. Yes, yes. And one of the things they did, they used to do is when you did something, like hit a home run. You come to your locker and you have an envelope full of money. Not too yeah. shabby. Yeah, they, they give shabby. you an envelope full of money. One night I hit a home run in the center field and they gave me double the amount that I normally got. Normally got. Now I said I asked one of the players. I said, "Well, I got more this time." He said, "Oh, you hit the center field. You get more home runs. You get more <laughs> money when you hit the center field." Is that That's still going cool. on? Do they still have that system where they, they, they... I, I don't know, but I know in 88 they did. That's I pretty said, neat. I did that a long time ago. I'd have been trying to hit in the center field all the time. That's a fun story. That's a great story. What's in the future for you, Rupert? Well, this book, you know, I think this book is going gonna, is, is gonna to continue to sell. I, you know, I'm selling, you know, I, I'm not selling at the pace I would like to, but I'm selling that I'm selling them all, all all the same. And I just think the more people read it, the more they, un, you know, and, and the more people that get a chance to look at it, it's going to, it's, it's going to catch on because it's, it's a powerful story. It's a story, it's, it's, it's a story like no other story. Okay. And not just because I wrote it, but it's a story like, like nothing. And to be honest, I never thought I could create something of this nature. When I tried to do this, started out, I didn't think that I was going to be as successful. You know, I was going to be as, the story is going to be as good as it is. And this story is really powerful. Well, you lived a very interesting life and it's just so much fun to have a chance to chat with you. I know a lot of the Seattle baseball fans are going to be, have fun uh, listening to this interview and, and hearing some of your thoughts. And I, I really appreciate you coming on Sports Untold today. It's been a lot of fun. And I actually have a friend who I went to high school with. He he want, wants me to mention that people would sometimes chant my last name, but not the same way they chanted your name at baseball. Well, how did they, well, they chant your name? Well, last name is Schneiderman. I think people were always joking, like to joke around with me a lot. It was, it wasn't, it wasn't because I was any big deal at all. But, but I guess got a, 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 a on Facebook, a friend of mine wanted to say that, uh, tell him about the Schneiderman chant. So I had, I had to mention that. So I'm a little embarrassed mentioning it. But can um, I, can I, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Well, I can, I like to make a comment. Yeah, go ahead, please. If you took your time and you wrote down your life, you would be fascinated by what you would come up with. You would also be fascinated by what it takes from, in the, from you to, to, to recreate your story. And it is, it is like no other experience. This is part of my greatest accomplishment. But I don't have, I don't have the major league baseball stories. You don't I don't have, that, you know, you there, have, there, there's you so much stories. in your life that's you that's more stories. colorful and it has, it's more. You got stories, Paul. You are, you said, what is it, you a lawyer? Work as attorney. That's correct. That's correct. That's one reason I had an excuse. I haven't read your book yet because I had a lot of read. I've had a lot of reading to do this week. That's my excuse for you. I haven't started. I'll guarantee yet. you some of your collegiate stories will be kind of, will be kind of funny. Well, I don't know. Maybe to some people. Well, Rupert, let's you and I stay in touch. And thank you so much for, for doing this. It's just been a great uh, highlight of my week to have a chance to, to chat with you. And uh, thanks for coming on Sports Untold. Did you pass the bar exam the first time? 
I did, and there's many good lawyers who did not pass it the first time. You know, the famous lawyer, Jerry Spence, he didn't pass it the first time. Uh, there's a lot of famous lawyers and very accomplished lawyers who didn't pass the bar the first time. I don't think it's the best indicator of law practice success, no, by the way. So. No, because basically, never give up, okay? We're going to we gonna have more negative things happen to us in our life than positive. But the positives are going to be the one that's going to keep us going. The positives are the one that we that we that we look for, we search for. I but love how we can we can finish up here with "Never Give Up," the title of your of your new biography. I love the theme. I love the theme. Yes, so, sir. Great. Well, all the best, Rupert, to you and your wife, and thank you for coming on Zoom. And uh, uh, let's stay in touch. Okay, Paul. Thanks, Rupert. You take care, you take care of yourself. You too. Stay safe. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm.